Good evening, everyone. Happy in preparation for Earth Day, Zoom. Today, <laughs> we are so fortunate because we're going to be exploring Earth and landscapes through art with local Crestwoodian Professor Valerie Franco. And she is going to take us on a tour of many artists' works. And these artists have taken their love and their passion and their desire to protect the environment and translated that into iconic images of our beauteous earth. So without further ado, I'm going to give it over to the one, the only Val Franco. No, thank you so much, Z. And this wonderful, wonderful place that we call home that is Crestwood Public Library. Um, it's nice to see everybody, Marianne, of course, see Jackie, Ellen, Kathy, uh, Nelda and Wale are with us and Gloria. It's so nice to see everybody. Uh, let's jump in, shall we? I wanted to start, um, start out for a, a, a minute first and talk about a little bit of the history behind um, Earth Day and how we even got to this concept of what is Earth Day. You know what, I'm just gonna do something very quickly. Hold on one second, I'm gonna do this. This makes it a little easier, how's that? Okay, so let's jump in so everybody can see the screen. So let's talk about the very first Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970, it's been over, this is gonna be the 52nd, it's kind of amazing, um, the history that Earth Day has. And this gentleman on the top right of your screen and the center of your screen, Senator Gaylord Nelson, um, this is him uh, actually at, at uh, the St. Croix River overlooking um, uh, uh, in between Minnesota and Wisconsin. This was a waterway he worked to protect. He was very interested in um, uh, environmental issues. And so, you know, in the 1960s, way before most of our times, um, there were very limited environmental laws. Oh, I'm so sorry, I did not mute that. There were very limited environmental laws. And um, hold on one second. Give me one second, my friends. I'm just gonna mute that for one second. Ah, of course, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. All right. So very limited environmental laws in either case. And so the um, air was really polluted. The water was really bad. There was no such thing as the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. So industries could spew out pollution. It was not uh, an issue. There was no worry about legal repercussions, you know? Um, and people were just used to dirty air, dirty water. Um, at the same time, there was a war raging in Vietnam. So college students and um, and a lot of the counterculture, you know, they were called the hippies at the time and the yippies, right? The youth um, culture um, were protesting nationwide in um, opposition to the war. So um, Senator Nelson thought, well, you know, this would be kind of an interesting thing to do. Let's combine the need that we have to protect the, the earth and, and, and eliminate or limit at least pollution and utilize this young faction of the country who are already used to being politically active. And so he was really kind of brilliant, you know, this idea. So um, he was serving uh, as governor of Wisconsin, and that's where he started his environmental legacy. They actually called him the conservation governor. And so he was interested. He noticed how teach-ins, <coughs> excuse me, how important teach-ins were these anti-war teach-ins. And he thought, hey, why don't we try and get college kids to um, protest against pollution and move for a cleaner environment? And so that's what he envisioned, a national teach-in for um, public awareness on the environment. And he thought it would kind of put it into the national spotlight. And just so you know, the image on the bottom left is an image of, you know, of smog, like of a, a day in the life of, you know, the, a, the city, a city, right? Um, I keep wanting to say it's LA, but it's not. But the smog that was visible in the, the 70s, the, the late 60s, early 70s, that's what it looked like all around the country. I'm going to show you an image of LA in a little bit. You're going to be shunned 
so was absolutely stunned. So September of 1969, Nelson called for Americans to come together in the following spring for a day just dedicated to environmental education. And so he um, organized a separate organization that was called the Environmental Teaching. He hired a staff of 85 to promote events across the country. And he let each area, because you know different re regions have different environmental issues. Some are more concerned with their waterways, some are more concerned with their soil, but pretty much everybody's concerned with their, their air, you know, but everyone had different problems that they wanted to focus on. So he established a steering committee of scientists and academics and environmentalists and students. And he created uh, another congressman to serve as his co-chair. And, um, and they got together and did this very first Earth Day on April 22nd, uh, 1977 for a healthy, sustainable environment. And people marched, they demonstrated, they held rallies, they um, held um, educational activities across the party lines, uh, Republican and Democrat alike. And it was actually quite incredible. And because of these actions over the years, which eventually spread internationally, um, now it's uh, over 200 million people um, in 184 countries. So almost the whole entire planet observe or do something, do some type of activity to commemorate Earth Day. And in the US, because of his actions, this is why he received the uh, Medal of Freedom from um, President Clinton. We have the Clean Air Act. We have the Water Quality Improvement Act. We have the Environmental Protection Agency. We have um, uh, things like the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Endangered Species Act, the Federal Land Policy and Management Act. I mean, this is all as a result of uh, Earth Day and the political um, galvanizing of the public. Now, one quick question. Let me see if I can get this forward for us. Why do you think it was April 22nd? Well, it was in between a lot of the spring breaks for various colleges and final exams. So that meant a lot of college kids were in school so you could really maximize participation. And I mean, think about this. Um, just on the Earth Day, over 20 million people involved just in this country, 2,000 colleges, 10,000 elementary and high schools, over 1,000 communities, it's massive. But uh, um, planet-wide, over 200 million people um, uh, participate. And the other thing that's really important it, is it paved the way for the United Nations to actually have an Earth Summit in 1992 in Rio and really look as a, as a united whole what we could do to, to change pollution, to stop this degradation of the environment for the planet. So before, this is LA and after. I mean, think about how this has changed. Look at the smog um, that was rife in LA in the 70s. There used to be so many smog jokes in the 70s. Now it's, it's cleaned up. You know, it's, now you see more air pollution from the fires. The fires are so bad and so frequent there, but that's a different issue. And this is a, a cover from the New York Times um, on uh, the Earth Day obser observation. Keep in mind, just as an aside, we are sponsored by this fantastic library, the Crestwood Public Library. So if you feel like you want to do a little bit more research on the subject, uh, the library resources are right at your fingertips virtually, or you can uh, go in, in person and, and really see, you know, and do some digging and do some research into this. But I thought this was interesting to have a little bit of a background on Earth Day and why we're doing this particular class and why we're looking at these beautiful landscapes um, and all these places, because we're going to go everywhere. We're going from England to Massachusetts to Japan to South America, you're gonna really see a lot of different images from different places that are just so galvanizing tonight. Okay, so let's jump in. Let's talk about this man on the bottom. This is the artist, John Constable. He was born 1776. It's kind of a busy year that year, if you were English or would become American, right? 1776 for us, especially very busy year. Um, and he passed away in 1837. So. Uh, this is an, an image that he painted. He was famous for his landscapes. That was his specialty. Uh, and they're mostly of the countryside where he grew up in Suffolk. He was born, he lived there. He felt that you paint what you know. 
um, and he felt that it was so beautiful. You know, why would he want to paint anywhere else? So this was very interesting. And um, what he would do is he would go out and he would get into the environment and paint these um, open air sketches, like preparatory sketches. And then he would use these as a basis for creating very large paintings, uh, you know, com completed paintings in his studio. So he wasn't quite painting on plein air that he was like the impressionists would do in the 1870s, finished paintings on site outside, but he would do his preparatory work outside and then finish it in his studio. And he's very popular today. We love his work. Um, the French always loved his work, but in England during his lifetime, eh, not so much. They weren't so excited with it, sadly. So, um, you know, he, so it, it's interesting how, you know, one country loved his work and received him and his home country, not so much, but that's okay. We appreciate him. So um, he was born in Suffolk. He was largely self-taught. He developed slowly. And by 1800, by the turn of his century, when he was about 24 years old, he was a student at the Royal Academy schools. And he actually exhibited at the Royal Academy in London, which was very prestigious, still is actually very prestigious to do. Uh, if you, uh, we actually were talking about some artists during Women's History Month who had exhibited at the Royal Academy. So you can um, call back on previous lectures and, and do some research, but it was very, it's very prestigious to exhibit at the Royal Academy. And then later on, he exhibited at the Paris Salon, which again was academic style of painting, very um, formal, very uh, particular style. And then they loved his work there. They accepted his work. In fact, he was so important as an artist. He influenced what we, we call the Barbizon School, the group of painters that got uh, collected outside of Paris in the Fontainebleau Forest and painted these beautiful landscapes. And, and Constable was a bit of an influence on that. And it was even an influence a little bit on the French Romantic movement. So you can't underestimate the importance of his work and, um, and the way he used color, the way he uses composition, the realism, the vitality. It was all very highly original in concept and, and it's just romantic. Now this is um, Bolius Cove and Jordan Hill. I've actually included a little map for you um, on the left. The inset shows all of the United Kingdom, okay? That little inset in the corner. But this part of the map, this shows you where the cove is on the southern westernmost corner, you know, that region of England. So you get an idea of where this is along the coast. Um, and it's about three hours by car southwest from London. So to give you an idea, of course, in the 1800s, it would have been a much longer trip, a much longer schlep, but it would have been worth it to get out of the crowds and the noise and the cacophony of London. And so to be along the coast, to see the beautiful land, the quiet, the color, it's remarkable. Now, I want you to look at these clouds moving across the bright sky. This is actually um, more of a, a, a winter period, but I thought it was nice to mix up some of the seasons. I wanted to focus mostly on summer, but this is a little bit of a mix here. The sandiness that you see, the sandy cove, the sand, the sea even, you could see on the right, the way the downs slope down to the cove, the, the downs are, you know, those rocks, those rocky promontories. Um, we could see the waves rolling into the beach, the thick streaks of gray and white paint that mirror the color of the clouds. So there's that reflection of the sky that we see in the water, and it's just beautiful. Um, also, I want you to notice where the light is coming from. So the light in this particular painting, right, coming from, as you look at it, coming from your left and illuminating the sides and bottoms of those clouds with that beautiful yellow and light pink light, that refracted sunlight that you get when the sun is right at the horizon, either when it's coming up for the sunrise or going down for the sunset. And so what happens is the light reflect, refracts and only certain waves, certain colors come through. And then of course you have the clouds which capture that light. And because of the humidity and the particulate matter that makes up clouds, right? Um, that further acts to refract the light and give you these beautiful, beautiful colors and images. This is one of the reasons why 
a blue sky is phenomenal. You guys know what I always say. If you heard me lecture before, a blue sky is fantastic when we want to go and picnic outside or go to the beach. It's wonderful if you're Georgia O'Keeffe doing the Southwest. But if you are a painter, you need clouds in the sky for drama. And so Constable, think of Turner, every Turner image, boy, it's dramatic, right? So Constable gives us these clouds, but they're moving towards us. They're actually moving, if you notice, they're kind of echoing the line of the coast. They're not going horizontally across the frame. They're coming, they're doing like a vertical echo of the coastline here. So he has various planes, various lines in this painting that he's exploring. And then this movement of the clouds in these various directions. It's just so beautiful. He's so, it's so thoughtful and so um, unique and individual and different than what had been done before. So he was staying in a little vicarage in this small village near Weymouth during his honeymoon of 1860. And this is when he created this. Now there's a few versions of this painting. And you know, we talk about that as well, how all different artists um, tend to paint and repaint and, and go back and revisit certain subjects, certain topics, certain times of day or times of year over and over again. They rework it. They see what, they, what, what, is, what is it like in a different time, a different um, setting with different colors. In fact, we're gonna look at a Japanese uh, woodblock print in a few minutes, and you're gonna see exactly that same thing happen. What happens if we play with the concept of color with this? But here, now this is one of three versions of this particular view that Constable did. And this is the version in the National Gallery in London, all right? Um, the first is at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. And it's like a small oil sketch, just of the stormy sky. So then there's the larger, more finished painting that's at the Louvre. So let me show you this. So this one, um, uh, uh, Weymouth Bay with approaching storm 1819, this is the version at the Louvre. But look at similarities. Look at the way he, uh, the similar um, layout of the clouds. You can see some differences. We can see a lot of similarities. Look at how he lays out the way we see that promontory, the way we see the field off in the distance. Notice how the color pattern is different. Notice how we're pulled in a little tighter. There's not so much water on the left, not so much of the downs of that rocky promontory on the right. So he really pulls us in. The changes the palette, changes the light. So very interesting. Constantly exploring, constantly thinking, constantly appreciating the world around him, the planet, the landscape. You know, keep in mind also, the way the bluff sort of shows through a little bit, the light color there, the weight to the clouds. There's like a, a spontaneous feeling to this, kind of a light sketchy feeling to this, but it's because of the way he uses color and light and texture and the way he composes the image. So it just feels so light and fast and beautiful. This was a hallmark of Constable, quite, quite incredible. Um, the other thing I want you to think of as you look at this is that, you know, he spent six weeks in this area when he was on his honeymoon from um, like mid-October to the end of December in uh, uh, 1816. And so, you know, his wife, the woman that he married was from Suffolk. So it made sense, you know, that they would kind of go and, and have this wonderful stay. He was actually um, invited there, uh, the small village near Weymouth because um, the, the friend who married them um, was the vicar there. So they had a place to stay. That was how they spent their honeymoon. So the man who married them, the reverend said, hey, my house has this gorgeous view. You can study and paint from my very windows. And he said, the countryside is sublime and well worth the painter's visit. And so Constable did, he took his wife there and he made about 20 or so drawings, numerous oil sketches, numerous watercolors, all of the smaller bays and all of these images. And you can even see there's little paths that lead down to the um, uh, to Weymouth Bay and it's just gorgeous. Now, um, one thing I want you to keep in mind is industrialization starts to develop and change the landscape and the world around us. The concept of painting nature, capturing it, grabbing it, 
holding on to it was becoming more and more popular. And these landscapes, these images were becoming more and more important, even as at the same time, images of um, people, of average people, of poor people, of poverty even, were also becoming more and more uh, a style in and of themselves. There was this recognition that people were being overlooked, that people were being passed by, that the environment was changing, that it was being lost. And so art reflects, uh, reflects that. And we see these beautiful images of the environment around us. And we also see at the same time, think of the Ashcan School in Philadelphia that moves up to New York, where there's these images of the poor, of um, the poverty stricken. And it's very interesting. We'll do a class on that maybe in the future. We have never done the Ashken School. We'll have to consider doing that. So look at this. This is called the cornfield. And Constable, it's quite large image, you know, and Constable called it, he said it there, he put in some, he included some eye salve. And you could kind of guess when you look at this and you see how desolate it is of people, he included some action here, some people, some figures some donkeys in the foreground towards the left. The one uh, boy, kind of uh, the, the shepherd taking a break, relaxing for a minute. You could see the sheep in the background. They almost look like foam, like froth on the field, across the cornfield, uh, getting a little drink of water there. It's really interesting. And he called, he called the figures eye salve because it would give you a rest for your eyes. It would give you something to look at and focus on aside from all of the vast expanse of nature. And he does this so beautifully. Look at how he uses the trees uh, left and right to kind of frame the action here. The donkeys in the foreground, the little grassy knoll there, the little path with the gate open, the boy getting water, the cornfield in back of him, that beautiful, swath of, of yellow corn and then the water and the sheep and the horizon going off into the distance leading up to that beautiful nuanced sky which also peeps through if you're looking at the screen all the way on your left <coughs> to the corner of the clouds so this is quite beautiful it's quite um evocative and pleasing to the eye you know it's noon, so the, the shadows are very, very short. Um, there's this concept of Suffolk in high summer. And of course, what happens? He does the preparatory sketches on location, the preparatory work, but then he paints it in his studio in the winter of that year of uh, 1826. And he paints this in his studio. So it's quite beautiful. In fact, Constable used to walk along this cornfield when he was a boy from his village to a neighboring village, Denham, where he attended school. And the lane still exists. It's kind of amazing. The lane still exists. But of course, the countryside is a bit different, you know, since this boat was taken. But you could see off in the distance, the church tower, um, the cluster of a few red roof houses that are artists, art, uh, artifice because they never really existed. So that's sort of interesting. Um, he invented the village so that you would have a focus point off in the distance. So your eye could look at something, your eye could rest. So it's very interesting. He didn't mean to depict everything faithfully. You know, it's almost like he's channeling, uh, we're gonna talk about Frederick Church in a slide or two. Actually the next slide I believe is Frederick Church. And um, Frederick Church really did not present anything realistically. He took different images and combined them. It was a, a combination painting. Real places, real sites, but not one specific real location. There's a bunch of locations that he would combine. So in this case, Constable is kind of um, channeling church and, and doing a, a little bit. Um, he called it landscape when he sent it to the Royal Academy to um, open the public exhibition on May 1st. And he didn't have that much time. So he had to work very quickly. He wanted to exhibit a different painting, a much bigger painting. But instead he did this. He was uh, having a little bit of trouble with money at the time. And so 
it, he he um did this coin field now it's not quite six he would do these six footers these massive paintings it's a little bit smaller but it really contributed to constable's reputation they really loved the work and uh and it it, it helped to secure him some commissions so it was very important uh now i want you to look at this and give me one second watch your eyes look at this painting and now look at this is going to blow you away isn't that incredible it's almost photographic it's so wonderful this reflection of the light as we look at twilight in the wilderness this is by frederick church and it's big you know four feet high by about seven feet across i mean it's a grand scale he painted this in 1860 but frederick church was another one of these artists he was so good at creating images, taking, going to a place, sketching out, doing preparatory work of all these different locations in, in, one, in one area, and then combining them together and making something wonderful. And he uh, was one of the Hudson River School painters. He's, we're actually gonna be uh, uh, hopefully doing some more with him in the future but he's actually just so wonderful. And he was looking at these places and capturing them before they would change from industrialization or you know, urban spread, which at the time wasn't really as, as bad as it is now, right? But, but this was important. This was very important. So for Frederick Church, this blazing sunset over the wilderness near um, in, up in Maine, in Mount Katahdin, uh, he had sketched it on a visit like two years earlier, and he was doing this. He's constantly sketching, keeping stuff, and then using it for inspiration later on. So, I mean, think about this. This is 1860. The country is just on the precipice of civil war. And so you can look at this painting and take it a few different ways. That the flames, the redness, the separation between sky and land kind of are presaging what's going to happen in the country the violence, the, um, the fighting, the separation of brother between brother. I mean, you can look at it as a symbol, right? Or you can look at it as Frederick Church showing us how wonder he, wonderful he is, how much skill he has, how um, clever as a showman he is. And you can interpret it either way, but it, this really contributed to his reputation as one of the most important, one of the best artists of his generation. So he was going to include it in a, uh, an exhibition. I know it's just like annual exhibition, but instead, what did he do? He went to a prestigious art gallery and he exhibited all by itself this painting at this very important art gallery. And so they did a lot of advanced publicity. Um, and, and so they had very favorable press reviews. Over a thousand spectators flocked to admire this in its seven week run. And in fact, this was something Frederick Church's works, it's kind of amazing. He, it's uh, really unreal. He was sort of like the rock star of his time, except for paintings. People would line up. So these paintings would go on exhibit in different locations, and people would line up and they would stand in line, sometimes two days, three days, to see however many days this painting was there. They'd pay their money and they'd go in with their magnifying glasses and they'd look at the detail and they see what flowers were included, what little animals were included, what type of plants were included because the details were so specific and incredible. And so this is how much people really loved the work of Frederick Church. You know, he's famous for his landscapes, born up in Hartford, local-ish, you can kind of claim him, right? Uh, it's, Hartford's not too far from us. Um, but his depiction of waterfalls, of mountains, of um, sunsets and, and sunrises. I mean, this is what he was known for. The realistic detail, the dramatic light, and the panoramic views. This is what made him just so, so famous. Now, sometimes he would debut his works in this just single painting exhibitions. And people would pay to come in and look at it as I mentioned, they'd wait online, they'd bring their magnifying glass. And it really contributed to his reputation. He was one of the most famous painters 
in the United States at the time. Absolutely remarkable. Now, it helps when you come from a wealthy family, you can pursue whatever interests you. And so uh, kind of, uh, Frederick Church was very lucky in that respect. Uh, he was able to start studying at a very early age. He was about 18. His family recognized his talent. They had the money to support him. So he started to study under landscape painter Art, uh, Thomas Cole. And Thomas Cole was up in Catskills. And so that's where uh, Fred went to study. And um, within two years, uh, Cole said, you know, he's so talented. He's so real. He wrote that church had the finest eye for drawing in the world, which isn't too shabby, right? So during the time that he was studying under Thomas Cole, Frederick Church um, explored New England. He traveled a lot with Cole. They went a lot of different places. They went to New York. They explored the Hamptons and Long Island. And um, I think it's called Mohonk House now, the Catskill Mountain House. They went up to the Berkshires and they were in New Haven and Vermont. And it's just remarkable. So think about the time period in the 1860s. Um, this uh, kind of broke a record for sales at the time. And he did very well with this. So I want you to just kind of take this in for a minute until I get to the next slide. And I want you to notice the panels, okay? It's like these horizontal slashes. Gosh, this could almost be a flag, right? The reds, the yellows, the ochres on the bottom. And if you look very carefully in the center of this, just underneath where the sky is so yellow from the sunset, underneath this beautiful, magnificent red clouds, you could see very gently off in the distance, more mountains, but they're so far. They have that haziness, that smoky blueness. It's just wonderful. So before I move out of this slide, I'm just gonna take a peek and see what the um, chats say in case I need to respond to somebody. So give me a minute. Okay, the bright color. All right. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm glad you guys really noticed. And yep, Robert, glad you liked it. This is great. Thank you, Z. Thank you, Marianne. Yeah, right. The colors are so vibrant. It's just amazing, right? You almost feel like it has to be a photograph. It can't be painted, but it is. And notice too how he includes little bits of blue sky in the left and the right because that acts as a nice foil, a nice counter. But the movement of the clouds, the color of the clouds, oh, wow. Now, this here on the bottom left, this is uh, Thomas Cole. I'm sorry, uh, Frederick Church. This is um, Thomas Cole's student, Frederick Church, the man that we're looking at, the man that we're talking about right now. And, you know, he was really one of the first artists to truly do composite landscape painting, to use images that he sketched from various locations, make them... Uh, part of one painting, which it would be much more detailed, much more spatially complex as a landscape than the way Thomas Cole painted, for instance, than the way his teacher painted. And his teacher was fine with that, but it's really remarkable. So when you look down here at this image and the little bridge and the little uh, covered wagon crossing over, you have the sense of scale, right? You look way off in the distance, you see that beautiful house, that building, Maybe it's a church, maybe it's in a mill house, but right near where the water fountain is, the reflection of the sky on the water, the beautiful depths, how far away that mountain is, how far away even further are the ranges in back of that that are like that smoky purplish blue. And then that rise of clouds off into the left, kind of tickling the belly of the sky. It's wonderful. And again, notice how he uses on either side, a larger tree on our right, a smaller tree on our left. It's just phenomenal. So fantastic. So this, you know, um, it, it's a funny thing. And, and I hate to kind of say to talk about um, auction prices, because that doesn't mean anything about the aesthetic value, the true beauty of a painting, or the lack of the tr true beauty of a painting. But it's a really interesting thing. Um, in 2019, uh, let me give you um, a South American landscape. Look at this. We'll come back in a minute to the New England scene. I don't want you to be lost about this. But 
his South American landscape that he did in 1857 just sold before COVID for $1.8 million, which is massive, right? When we looked at the other painting that sold for $130 in his lifetime, which was very good money then, make no mistake. But what's the deal here? This estimate, uh, this price that it had gotten, sorry, was actually one fifth less than what the estimate was that they thought they were gonna get. So why this fluctuation in the prices of um, church when you could see how beautiful his landscapes are, how he's holding on to fragments in time and places in the world that you know are subject to change. Eh, there's interest, there's styles, there's fads, there's trends. So sometimes representational art takes a little bit of a hit, you know. Uh, but what happened was this was bought by the museum in Tyson, and um, and he was really appreciated for his contribution to painting. Again, look at that sense of depth. Notice, if you will, she might be hard to see. Um, but if you look all the way down at the bottom, you just going to make this small for one second, just so I can give you my cursor for one quick second. OK, hold on. So look at this right over here. He has a woman oops, right there walking in the foreground to us. He has a little architectural element here with a little um, walking area. So there's people there. We have this sense of human involvement, but it's it gives your eye a rest, right? So I want you to look at this again in greater detail and notice again, that vertical palm tree to kind of frame us, the hillocks that rise on the left again, kind of acts as framing in the foreground and the woman coming at us through that path on the bottom. And then the way, way off in the distance, that mountain opens up with the snow covered top and it's just remarkable. And the way the clouds off to the left sort of echo the colors of the mountain. It's just, it's absolutely stunning. It's so wonderful. This is kind of priceless um, Frederick Church. Now, let's go to Japan. Let's look at the work by this man, uh, Katsushika Okutse. This is just so famous. I'm sure you've seen, if not this image, at least a version of this image, a version of Mount um, uh, Fuji. And it's just wonderful. In fact, very sophisticated, very simple, um, a beautiful view of Mount Fuji. And it's direct and it's immediate. There's not anything else really, a little bit of uh, detail in the sky. You know, the, the, as you go down below the frost line, the trees on the bottom left. But this is, he wants you to focus on this mountain. In fact, I'll tell you a secret. He was a little bit um, obsessed with this painting, with this Mount Fuji. Uh, not just with the paintings, but he was so obsessed with the mount that he did 36 views of Mount Fuji because he loved Mount Fuji so much. Could you imagine? And this is a selfie. This is an etching that he did of himself. But could you imagine loving a place so much that you uh, do all of these beautiful versions of images of this painting? Now, hold on one second. Oh, I can't do that. Hold on one second. I want you to see this. I want you to hold on to the set of colors and this composition, this, the palette that he's using here. And let me just explain a little bit more about his life and career to you because he's so remarkable. Um, of course, he's painting one of Japan's most revered landmarks, one of its most famous landmarks. And so instead of following like the stylistic type of Japanese painting, Hokusai is doing something different. He's playing around. He's producing an image in a straight line from his imagination. And he actually apprenticed to a woodblock engraver, a wood engraver. So he knew how to do conventional painting and also how to illustrate for books. He knew the process that was involved. He was a very smart man. Um, and so he would produce images just from the straight line that was used to make these prints. So it's absolutely wonderful. He delighted in feats of artistic skill. He wanted to push himself. He wanted to see what he could accomplish. Sometimes just at the very last moment, um, you know, he would look at a bird or look at an animal as it was moving and try to get in some brush strokes and 
create that animal just very fast. So he was very observant as well. Um, his use of color led to a massive influence on the work of guys like Edward Monet and the other, um, some of the other Impressionist artists. In fact, a lot of Impressionist artists had Japanese woodblock prints. A lot of them had work by Hokusei. Some of them uh, a little more um, uh, off color works that they collected. But these artists were influenced by this um, uh, style of painting by the Japanese, this, this woodcut style these woodcut prints. So it really had far reaching implications and in, uh, affected and influenced generations of painters even outside of the realm of Japan. So very important. Now, I want you to look at something, all right? Um, because this gets interesting. Oops, let me see if this works. There you go. So what happens? It's basically the exact same painting still Mount Fuji, but this is a variant from 1830. And look at how, let me just back up for you. So look at this image, look at what he keeps and look what he gets rid of, All right? The background is completely different, even the sky. It's almost um, three-dimensional as if we're in a, um, a, a diorama box, right? You know, it's very interesting. And the mountain seems so flat because of his choice of color, the way it's outlined, he does show snow on top of it, but it still feels sort of flat. And then the way he's pushed the tree line down a bit. So very interesting. What these little changes, why he does that? What's, what's his purpose? So literally this painting called um, South Wind, Clear Sky, right? Uh, what's the story behind it? It's so bold, it's so simple, it uses color so well, this particular piece, that it influenced an entire generation of artists that followed. Uh, they were uh, also known as Red, red uh, Fuji. So that's, you know, you look at the color of this. Oops, hold on one second. I'm gonna let you look at this for one second. I'm just gonna, I can't mute myself, sorry. So look at this and look at the difference. Look what, when you pull away color. So amazing, right? And then it allows you also to focus on the shape of the, the, the of, um, Mount Fuji, of the strength of it, of the sheer solidness of it. And you really kind of start to consider life in a different way when you look at these images. You know, there's a um, an interesting... Uh, thing to note is very rarely would he include images of people that changes in, unless he was trying to get across the message of scale, of how big, how um, beautiful. I'm trying to get a little light on my face for you, you guys. I'm sorry. Hold on. Come with me. I'm going to turn on some light uh, so you could see me a little better. Oops. Um, yeah, the sense of, of um, the way he would use light and color and changing from one palette to the next. And the way it changes the way you see this image, it's just remarkable. So up oh, there we go, there's some light. Oh, so there you go, so there's our light. So look at how beautiful this is. This just kind of changes so much, right? When you have this different palette. I don't know if you have a favorite, so I'm gonna give you both of them again one more time. And then we're gonna, move on a little bit and look at a, a different um, view, a different image by uh, Hokusei, you know? It's just remarkable. He also he apprenticed to a, uh, an engraver. So he had a lot of experience and a lot of understanding of how to work with woodblock prints and how to work with these images and, and kind of bring them to fruition. And so uh, he would, instead of doing uh, following the trend of the way other artists presented Mount Fuji, he was moving in a very different direction, parring away the detail, producing the image straight from his imagination. So it was a very fresh view and right from his mind's eye, you know. And so he knew how to do conventional painting, but he also learned how to do book illustrations. And he would um, abandon this concept for this four colored wood block 
print design and, and really kind of played with this. And if you notice, if you look, look at how many colors are involved in each woodblock print and it's very limited. So you don't need a lot of color to accomplish something, but the way that you use the color, the way that you set up your composition, it really means something. Uh, it's just remarkable. It's just wonderful. So, uh, and you know what, I just want to do one other thing. Look at the red here. Let's go back for one second and look at the red there. Look at how two different artists on two different continents, well, two different parts of the world, utilize color so vividly, so strongly, but in very different ways, right? It's always fun to make these comparisons and, and always think about that as you look at work. So look at this, close your eyes for a minute, keep this image, Twilight in the Wilderness in your mind's eye, ready? Close your eyes, one, two, three, keep them closed and now open them and make the comparison to what uh, Katsushika Hotsuka is doing with Mount Fuji. And it's just remarkable. It's really fun though, right? To make comparisons, to really be observant about that. Um, one of the most simple and yet one of the most outstanding of all Japanese prints. And when they talk about Mount Fuji in his series, the views of Mount Fuji that he was so obsessed with, that's, what, that's how people refer to this. Simple and yet one of the most brilliant. Now, let's look at this. We'll move forward. Say goodbye to Mount Fuji. We'll come back. Maybe we'll do him uh, another time. But I just, there's two more images, uh, two more artists really that I want to show you before we uh, finish for this evening. Um, and, and actually, do me a favor, uh, ignore that for one second. That really is not accurate. There you go. That's for the next piece I'm going to show you. But look at this. So we have a little map of Spain on the top uh, left of our uh, slide. And this is the region. This is where uh, he did this Asturian landscape around 1903, 1904. This is the Spanish painter, Joaquin Sorroye Bastida. And he was alive from 1863 to 1923. And I want you to look at this. Look at how he pulls away detail. It's not really photorealistic. You know, he studied, it's very interesting actually. He apprenticed, he studied under a photographer who would end up becoming his father-in-law, <laughs> funnily enough. Um, and he was very happily married with several children, several daughters. He was just, it was really kind of a fairy tale story. But by apprenticing to a photographer, his concept, the way you focus, the way you include detail and take away detail, it really affected his painting. And his painting, there's some of his images that are so photorealistic in quality, but the way the focus, what is in focus and out of focus, you know, with old fashioned cameras, and by that I mean cameras that are not on your cell phone for anyone under like 20, um, but real cameras that utilize lenses, you can zero in on certain areas and bring them into focus and then everything else is out of focus. And so you see that when you look at his paintings and it's just remarkable. You get the feeling of light, the reflection. I mean, look at this, the reflection of the light um, uh, from the sky on the water. You can feel that surface movement of the water. You have the beautiful gray sky that, the drama, the clouds give it that drama. And then the water, the coastline there, and that beautiful, luxurious, verdant greenery of the trees and the openings where some of the houses are, the clearings and the meadows. It is just incredible. So um, I don't know if you've heard me speak about, about um, Saroya, but it's just remarkable what he was able to accomplish and how he looked at the world, especially Spain around him, just absolutely phenomenal. Um, I wanna talk about him a little bit more. This painting actually, if you wanna see it in person, uh, is um, in the Brooklyn Museum. So I th think it's, it's quite worth uh, checking out if you ever have time, but look at the way he gets the tiled roofs of the buildings, the way that, that red, contrast with the green of the landscape, the, the meadows and the trees. It's just, oh, it's so delicious. And the water, it makes you, you just want to kind of jump in and swim in that right now, you know? But then look at this. This is also Soroya, same artist. But look at what a different style. Now, this is a different region 
of Spain, right? This is Valencia. This is actually where he was born. This is the region where he grew up and was born. And he's he did numerous paintings of um, the boats coming in or going out from the, the, the coast along Valencia. Also people just relaxing, enjoying the water, swimming. Um, this was the way he really kind of made his name, the beautiful light of the coast, the light off of the water. But look at how abstracted this is. And this is a little bit later on in his career. This is 1908. We're going to look at summer images and beaches later on this year when the weather gets warmer. But I just had to show you this because I think it's such a tremendous contrast to his earlier work. You know, he had so many different styles in him. He was studying, he was constantly pushing the envelope, constantly working, constantly thinking and playing with composition and light and color and abstraction. How much can you pull away from something before we don't know what it is? It's just remarkable. Um, he did a series of paintings, one for every region in Spain. They're massive works, um, 10, 14 feet across by, you know, eight feet high, uh, 10 feet high. They're massive. And they are in, uh, they have their own gallery at the Spanish Historical Museum in um, uh, uh, Upper Manhattan. But unfortunately, because of COVID, they're doing a renovation and, and COVID, they're not uh, open to the public right now. But I highly recommend as soon as um, the renovation is over, you get down there, you go to this museum and you see these series of paintings by uh, Soroya. They're a little bit different than what I'm showing you now. They're meant to re represent each region and um, typical climate, the location itself, the folk costumes of the people, what they're known for. It's kind of like um, these uh, travel shows, but in a, a, a painted image for each region. And it's just wonderful. He spent the last uh, 12 to 16 years of his life traveling around Spain sketching, uh, preparing, and doing these murals, and then sending them here to New York to be installed at the museum, uh, which happened just like at the turn of the century around 1912. And, but he never uh, was able to see them himself. He passed away without seeing them in situ in the, in the museum. And then final image. Now this is really a beachscape, I know, but I thought I would cheat a little bit because today was such a weird day, you know, and, and last week was so sunny and warm and beautiful. Today was so windy and cold and, and strange. So I wanted to end on a warm, sunny note. Um, but again, we'll, we'll focus more on beachscapes in, um, in the summer, but this is by Alex Katz. Um, he's an artist in his 90s, still creating, still painting. The Met did a wonderful, um, uh, exhibition of his work a few years ago, just before COVID. He tends to paint very large, very flat images filled with light and um, sometimes these massive close ups of individuals. But I thought this was just great. This is really more like a portrait of the dog than it is a landscape or a seascape. But I just had to give it to you because it really made me smile all the past few weeks that I've been looking at it. Um, you can see how. Each brushstroke, the brushstrokes are super visible. It's kind of like um, uber impressionism, you know, um, but also the way the light is hitting the dog on one side and then the shadow on the other side of his body, the shadow that's being cast on the sand and how the painting is really split up. One half is the water and that abstract quality of the water. You almost feel like there's water going off into the sky in the distance, maybe a little bit of clouds way up on the horizon point, but then the other half is just sand. And the counterbalance between sand, the, the creaminess of the sand and the blueness of the water slash sky is kind of um, complemented by the creaminess, the yellowness of the dog in the foreground. And the swimmer off in the distance, right at the water's edge. So I just thought this was so sweet. I had to give this to you guys and give you some nice, bright, happy light. But think about this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop us now and see if there's any questions to be considered. Uh, it's the, the hour goes so fast, right? When you have fun. But um, I mean, we, we went from Spain 
to Massachusetts, to Japan, to uh, uh, Central America, and then also to, to England. So we really were looking in so many different parts of the world. And it's so many different artists, various time periods, various styles. So I want you to think about this in the future. The next time, well, two things. I'm going to give you homework, but you don't have to do it. Oh, hey, Reed family. Nice to see you guys. Hi, Regina. Um, Ellen, Tim, good to have everybody. Um, you don't have to do this, but I want you to consider this. And, and we're going to, you could pick up tomorrow papers on, on how to make your own landscape. So I want you to think about the way you can kind of break down a landscape into, into planes, into panels, almost like into layers. You can have the grasses, you know, is one layer, the trees are another, maybe the sky, and then the clouds are another layer. So it's this very rich combination of various colors um, and, and layers. Let me give you a perfect the example that I wanna just remind you of, because it's so beautiful is uh, that Frederick church. And you don't have to paint it this way, but you see the church, how everything is kind of panels, um, uh, sections of color, the clouds on top, that beautiful open sky, the yellow sky where the light is just so intense. And then the mountains off in the distance, and then the mountains close up in the bottom, like a uh, quarter of the, the panel. You can do this, you can create a specific landscape and throw some trees in the foreground, or you can abstract it. So if you want to, if you're at the library tomorrow or anytime after that, you can pick up a sheet and learn how to do your own landscape. And I think it's gonna be fun for you in the next few weeks, look around outside. Notice if you see, when you look at open spaces, how the image in front of you is divided how you would recreate if you were an artist, okay? And you'll also be able to pick up the silhouette art uh, paper from our uh, activity last month. If you wanna do your own silhouette art at home, we have instruction sheet for you that you could pick up tomorrow, okay? So. <laughs>